Our culture and society tell us we are defined by the things we own, the money we collect, our pain and suffering, and our achievements in life. And yet God tells us that our value and worth can be defined by Him. We have been misinformed. Well, good morning. Rod Tidwell, professional football player, wide receiver, struggling to hit the superstar status. Jerry Maguire, the struggling sports agent trying to make it in a cutthroat industry, having a conversation over the phone, yelling at one another. I think you guys know what they are saying in this moment. What are these two guys saying to each other? Show, show me the money. That's right, a movie from the mid 1990s, 30 years ago. This is still a catchphrase today. This, this, we still use it, show me the money. And today, we are actually going to talk about money. Money factors into everything we do in life, does it not? Some of us have a lot of it, some very little. Some people seem to be really good at managing it, others not so much. Some people seem to be consumed with accumulating it and, 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 and using it. Others appear much more balanced when it comes to money. Some people, you know, the, you know these ladies in the room who have never paid full price for anything in their life. <laughs> and you know the people in this room who couldn't even spell the word coupon. I mean, we, we are all over the place when it comes to money, but here's the idea. At the end of the day, the reality is that money is actually a part of all of our lives. So the question that I want us to examine today centers around this right here. What do we believe about money? What do we believe? Because there's all kinds of messages about money in our culture. And one of the the most prevalent messages is this, money will make me happy. Is it true or have we been misinformed when it comes to what our culture tells us about money? That's what I want us to look at this morning. So if you have a copy of God's word, open it up to Mark chapter 10. That's gonna be our text today. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew back in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, Take that one with you. You do now. That is now yours. Make it your own and read it. In Mark chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 17, and we're going to be introduced to a man having a conversation with Jesus. Now, this story is also recorded in Matthew's gospel. In chapter, um, Matthew chapter, let's see, where is it here? Matthew chapter 19, and it's also in Luke chapter 18. So it's also in those two places. And now Matthew and Luke, Mark just says there's a man that comes to Jesus. But Matthew and Luke give us a little more detail about who this man is. They call him the rich young ruler. And so that is who Jesus is talking to in Mark chapter 10 in verse 17. And that's where we're going to pick up on this narrative today as we are in week two of a series that we're calling Misinformed. And our goal today, as it will be over the next few weeks, is to see the truth of what the Bible says about who we are versus the lies that our culture tries to feed us about our identity. That is our task today. So today, we're going to see how easy it is for our identity to be misinformed when it comes to money and just for the fun of it. Let's go ahead and throw possessions in there too. Money and possessions. Have we? That's the question today. Has our identity been misinformed when it comes to those things? 
Is that an area where we struggle from time to time in this area? So, let's look at the story. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. It says, and as he was setting out on his journey, this is Jesus, as he was getting ready to set out on his journey, a man, this is the rich young ruler, ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's a lot in this first verse. We learn a lot about the rich young ruler in this first verse in Mark chapter 10. We learn, first of all, when we pull in the other two gospels, that he's rich, that he's young, and that he's got some power and influence and authority. All things that the culture of the day valued and all things that our culture today values. Do we not? We value wealth, we we chase after youth, and we love power and influence. This guy has it all, but he doesn't just have it all. Look at what it says he does. It says he ran to Jesus. This shows intentionality. He wasn't just passing along, and oh, there's Jesus. You know, I was thinking about a question I had for him if I ever met him. No, he runs to Jesus. He's intentional about it, and he's passionate about it. He doesn't just meander. It says he runs to Jesus. Then it says he knelt before him. This is respect. He's showing honor to Jesus. He addresses him as good teacher. Now, in the Jewish culture, you didn't address a rabbi this way because the belief was, as we're going to see in just a minute, there was no one good but God. But he is giving Jesus a title that you did not give a person that you were addressing, no matter how good they were. And then it says, he asked him, a really good question. He's thinking spiritually, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, from first impressions, this is a good guy. I mean, we would want him at First Baptist Bernie if he lived today. I mean, we would watch him for a little while and say, put that guy on a committee. Like he's got it all. He, he's what we want. Let's get this guy plugged in at our church. So, Great first impression that we have here. And then let's look at verse 18. And Jesus answers his question. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, let's clear up a twisted scripture just quickly here. Jesus is not saying in this moment that he is not God. People will take this verse sometimes and say, see, Jesus never claimed to be God. That is actually not what he is saying here. What he is saying when he says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. He wants the rich young ruler to understand the weight of what he has just said. He wants him to understand. And and basically, he is saying this. Don't address me as good unless you are ready to acknowledge me as God in your life. Verse 19. He goes on. You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now, you might be saying, why did you start there, Jesus? I mean, the question... You know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus, for context, in in Matthew's gospel, chapter 22, when Jesus is pressed by the Pharisees, what is the greatest commandment? Remember what Jesus said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And he says, this is the greatest. But the second, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and all the prophets. What Jesus is doing is he's saying the 10 commandments, you could boil them down into two categories. Category one is the love the Lord your God category. Category two is how you express that in the way that you treat other people. And so here in this moment, Jesus is saying, let's talk about this list about how you treat other people. And those are the commands from the 10 commandments that he gives the rich young ruler. So it might seem for a minute, Jesus is kind of going along with the rich young ruler's framework here. And he's given him an answer of how to inherit eternal life and he's going along with it, but that is not at all what Jesus is doing. He is actually setting the stage for a much deeper conversation, a much more pointed conversation that he's about to have with the rich young ruler as we continue to read. So look at verse 20. The rich young ruler responds to him. He says, teacher, 
He's learned his lesson. He's not calling him good anymore, by the way. He says, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Now, we're starting to get just a glimpse, if you really think about it, about the heart of the rich young ruler here in this moment. It's our first glimpse. And what I would tell you, it's our first glimpse of what he is looking to as his true identity, what really defines him when he says, all these I have kept. He's got an inflated view of himself. I mean, he says, I, all of these, I mean, these are big words, all of these, Jesus, I have kept. I've never struggled with any of them. I've done it. All of these I have kept since my youth. Or is what he's saying here, as far as you know, and as far as anybody that sees me knows, I've done a good job of wearing the mask. I've kept these. I mean, what does Jesus say in the Gospels? He says, you've heard it said not to murder, but I say if you've had hate in your heart towards your brother, you're guilty of murder. You think this rich young ruler hasn't been guilty in his heart of every one of these things? Lust, greed, all of the coveting, all of these things that Jesus has already mentioned. Yes, but he is unaware. He's so consumed with the outside that he's, he's got an overinflated view of himself. He's self-righteous and his overconfidence is starting to peek through on some level. He has bought in to the thought of the day that if I am rich, then I must be right with God. Even the disciples, when we read through the Gospels, believe that, well, there's a wealthy guy that's got it going on. He looks good on the outside. He's got all the right stuff. God must really be happy with that guy because look how wealthy he is. I think the rich young ruler on some level has bought in to that and he is wearing that as his identity. I am the stuff. All of these I have kept since my youth. And I think we need to pause the narrative for just a minute right here and take a quick look at ourselves. Because based upon what we see about the rich young ruler in this passage, I think it's, I think it's right for us to ask some questions, to see if this is an area where our identity could be connected to money and possessions. Have we been misinformed in this way? So a couple of questions for us to start considering as we work through this passage. The first question, do I have a tendency to evaluate someone based on the appearance of wealth? Now you may say, whoa, 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 Daniel, time out, back off. I mean, why are you, you're getting a little hitting, you know, this is a little personal here. How dare you ask that of me? That I would judge somebody based on whether they look like they have or don't have money. I mean, you're going to have to not take this up with me. You're going to have to take it up with the half-brother of Jesus because in James' epistle, he's the one who says church people struggle with this very thing. We are guilty of evaluating people based on money. You see, people without a lot of money can be obsessed with trying to be like people who have it. They can be obsessed with trying to just, you know, do all the things they're doing, even if they gotta borrow tons of money to do it. We can be obsessed with saying, I wanna be like them. And we can also be obsessed with saying, you know, I need them to like me. I need to get in good with those people who seem to have it all because if I'm with them by association, then I must have value. But the other side of that coin is those who maybe have more money, who've been more successful financially, have a tendency to associate with other people who are kind of in their similar state lifestyle, their socioeconomic status, to the exclusion, whether it's intentional or unintentional, of those who have less than them. And here's the danger with that. Our Savior, when he walked on this earth, lived as a poor man. 
So sometimes our identity being rooted in money and needing to be associated with people who have money, we can miss the very people that God wants us to know and to associate with. But that's not the only question. There's another. What about me is tied to how much money I have? See, the rich young ruler's response to Jesus feels a little bit like he's saying, Jesus, I knew it. I've got it. I'm good here. You know, in a lot of ways, I think I can take care of myself. You know, I can figure things out. I kind of have a good thing going. But, but, but just in case I'm missing something, could you just give me something to do that could just ease my mind in those moments where I'm unsure if I'm right with you? Because I think I'm rich enough, and I think I'm powerful enough, and as a result, probably good enough to do whatever it is you tell me I need to do. That's, that's kind of the, the response that he's had up until this point. And so for us, what about us is tied to how much money we have? And here's some ways to discern that in your own life. Is my walk with Christ tied to how things are going for me financially? Do I question God when money's tight? God, where are you? God, do you love me? God, do you even care about me? Do I pray and read my Bible more when it looks like the money may not make it to the end of the month? Do I pray less and read my Bible less when I'm feeling pretty comfortable with my financial situation? Is my overall happiness, contentment, and even confidence connected to what I have or don't have. You know, if, the, if this had been a poor, sickly beggar instead of a rich, young ruler, I think the conversation would have looked different. I don't think he would have been so confident about what he was bringing to Jesus. So what about us is tied to money. Is it our identity? Let's continue to think about that as we continue in the passage here. Look at verse 21. After the rich young ruler has said, all of these I have kept. I'm not guilty of any of these, Jesus. I knew it. I'm good. You know, if I were Jesus, I think I would have been like, you idiot. But that's not what he does. Look at verse 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus looked at him, he loved him, and he said to him. That's a repeated pattern in the life of Jesus in the Gospels. He always puts his finger on the heart, the real issue. And that's exactly what he does here in this moment. But hear me clearly, because today, if God is putting a finger on this issue in your heart, please know this, that just like with the rich young ruler, he looked at him and he loved him. And therefore, he said to him, when Jesus puts a finger on an issue in our lives, when it comes to our identity, it is always motivated by love. He wants to correct it in order for us to have fellowship and intimacy with him. And he knows that's getting in the way. And so he will, in love, put his finger on issues in our lives. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He is saying to the rich young ruler with what he says, like, go, get rid of it. Get rid of everything that you're trusting in. Give away all that stuff that you've made your idol and go and place yourself in a position where all you have is me. And let's get on with it. He says, you want to have eternal life? You want to experience a full life? Then get rid of that stuff that is holding you back that you are placing your identity in. That is the press of Jesus here. 
Another place that a scripture gets twisted sometimes. People will look at that verse and say, well, in order to have eternal life, it must be that I have to do something. Because he tells the rich young ruler, go and sell everything and give all the money away or give it all away and, and give it all to the poor and then you'll have life. And so you could look at that and say, well, a religious expression or a good deed must be what God is looking for in order for me to be right with him. But that is not at all what he is saying in this moment. He is saying, listen, young man, your allegiance up until this point has been to your money. I want you to give your allegiance to me. Young man, you were calling me a good teacher. Now it's time for you to show that you really believe I am God and place your faith and your trust and give your allegiance to me. That is what he is saying. It's not a religious expression. It's not a good deed that he's after. It's a heart change that he is looking for, that he is calling for in the rich young ruler. And this is where identity comes into the story. Because what we're gonna see in the next verse is that the rich young ruler's allegiance is going to expose his identity. Because think back, deep down, he actually knows there's something missing. He ran to Jesus and he asked him, what must I do? And he even knows who to go to to find what he's missing. He runs to Jesus. So surely that is going to be enough for him to make the right decision. Jesus has given him the answer. Your allegiance must be to me and not your money if you want to have eternal life. And he knows there's something missing. So surely, verse 22 is going to be a great verse where he goes and he gets rid of those idols in his life and he follows Jesus in joy and with abandon. Correct? Before we look at the answer, I want to pause right here. And as lovingly but as plainly as I possibly can, before we look at his response, I wanna talk about something. You see, with misinformed identities, especially the one we're looking at today, but really all of them, the tendency is going to be to dismiss it like it's not a big deal, to minimize it, I can deal with that, I don't need any help, or to really deflect it and say that's somebody else's problem, it's not mine, but please, Please, this morning, don't do that. Because with this misinformed identity today, here's the deal. In our culture, if you were to poll the vast majority of the American people, they would say that our culture has a problem with money and greed and consumerism. But if you were to poll that same majority of people and ask them if they have a problem with money and greed and consumerism, they would tell you, I don't, I'm good. Both of those can't be true. And that is, the, that is what is so sneaky and damaging about our identity and our identities being misinformed. They can be hard to see in ourselves. But here is the good news. Even though they can be hard to see and even harder to root out of our lives, if you are sitting here today as a follower of Jesus Christ, and whether you live like it every day or not, your identity is not rooted in these things. And here's the deal. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit in you who will give you the power to see those false identities that we sometimes gravitate to. And he will give you the power if you are willing to root them out and to live differently. Amen? But here is something, in order for that to take place, we must believe what you see on the screen right now. That our allegiances will expose what we believe defines us. Every time. You can't fool them. You can't fool the things that you believe define you. Because if you believe it defines you, it is going to leave traces in your life. In little ways, and in big ways. And we're gonna see that as we finish the story. Look at verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, 
He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, if you weren't reading this with your church clothes on and your Jesus glasses on and you weren't sitting here all sophisticated or you didn't already know how this story ended, if you were just hearing this for the first time, you would scream, what? This guy walks away from Jesus? Is he nuts? I mean, he was there, he was this close and he walked away. Why would he walk away? It's even clear in the language of this verse that he knew he was making the wrong decision when he made the wrong decision. But yet he still made the wrong decision. I mean, that's insanity, is it not? To know what you should do? To be told how to do it and then to say, yeah, never mind. I mean, he knows. It says he walks away sorrowful, disheartened. This is crushed in the original language. This is like his whole countenance is changed. Like he walks away slumped over, probably weeping, knowing that he's just made the biggest mistake of his life and yet he makes it. So why is it so clear to him that he's made the wrong decision, but yet it's not clear to him why he made it? It has everything to do with his identity. Here's something I want you to see. Because this is the dangerous thing that we have got to expose. When what we believe about our identity, look at this right here. Our identity beliefs will form allegiances in our lives. Those allegiances will create appetites. And those appetites will demand to be fed. And the feeding of those appetites look like actions. They are the things that we do. But we don't just do them in isolation. We do them because they are tied to things. These appetites are dangerous. What we believe about our identity will create them because there are allegiances that are formed based on our identity. And here is the danger about an appetite. An appetite, you know this, it is never fully or finally satisfied. If you get hungry and you feed yourself, you're like, oh, I'm good. I'll never be hungry again. No, your appetite will come back and you'll be hungry again. And here's the other thing, an appetite always says now, never later. Appetites can be very dangerous things in our lives. So if what we believe about who we are in in our identity, if what we believe is a lie and that what we have defines us, Here's the appetite it will create. It will cause us to set out in the pursuit of money at all costs because we've created a powerful appetite that says, you must feed me. And a money appetite can express itself in a lot of different ways. The need for financial security, to be obsessed with how much money you've got in the bank, I'm constantly looking at the stock market, checking my 401k, seeing how much I have in savings, and everything about me is tied to how that is doing because I need to feel secure, and my money is what makes me secure. It can also express itself in a need for status or reputation. I've got to wear the right clothes. I've got to drive the right car. I've got to have the right size house. I've got to have the right toys so that people can see my value. A money appetite can also express itself in a need to belong. Well, the reason I've got to have it all or experience it all is so that I can post about it all and so that everybody can see who I am and so that I can fit in with the people that I think matter. Our social media culture has fed this appetite of consumerism like crazy because not only do we need to have it all, we've got to experience it and we've got to tell everybody because that's how we fit in with the people that we think we should fit in with. It also expresses itself in a need for comfort. I got to have all the extras because the only way to have a good life is me to want for nothing. 
That's the only way life is good is if there are absolutely, there's nothing that I want for. I must be comfortable. And so I will sell out in pursuit of it. But a money appetite can also express itself in a need for excess. I've got to have the latest and the greatest and the best because it's the latest and it's the greatest and it's the best. So these appetites that need to be fed in our life, here's here's what ends up happening. We magnify things out of proportion when we've created a money appetite that's tied to an identity that we think it will satisfy. And our appetites also focus our minds on one thing and they blur out everything else. You know this to be true. And I know this to be true. And I was reminded of the truth of this back at the end of February. Remember when D-Now weekend? Uh, were you guys here for D-Now weekend? Remember Nick that preached that Sunday morning? Nick's a cool dude. I got to hang out with Nick for a little while. And Nick was a bad influence on me. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. He was a bad influence. I told him he was while he was here because he awakened something in me that had been dormant for a long time. And that is the fact that I like shoes. <laughs> I'm just confessing it right now. Right? I don't know that my identity is tied to it, but I do like shoes. And Nick just fed that. And so Nick and I went shopping on Saturday afternoon. He goes, let's go to the shoe store. I'm like, all right, we'll go to the shoe store. And I found the coolest pair of Jordans. I hadn't had a pair of Jordans since 1987 was the last time I had a pair of Jordans. But oh, I realized how much I liked them and I bought them. (laughs) And I love them. They make me feel cool when I'm wearing them. Not as cool as Nick, but you know, I'm trying here. But you know what happened? We had not even left La Quintera. Nick said, let's go to another store. I'd already bought these, by the way. And we walked to another store. I, haven't even, I don't even have them on yet. I'm not even enjoying having them yet. And I look on the shelf, and you know what's sitting there? A pair of Jordans that I don't have. <laughs> and I want them. I've wanted them ever since. I've looked at them every week. Full confession, okay? I struggle too. Full confession. I've looked at them online every week trying to justify the purchase. Have they gone on sale? Are they cheaper now than they were last week? They're sweet. They're brown leather. They've got like blue stitching in them. Oh, they're the coolest shoes. But you know what I realized? I couldn't even enjoy the ones I had because I was so focused on what I didn't have. That's an appetite. That is an appetite, and that is how dangerous they can be because our identity can get attached to them. So you know what I did? This is what I did, and I'm saying it to you today. You can hold me accountable. If you see me in a pair of low-top brown leather Jordans with a light blue, like Carolina blue stitching on them, tell me, you hypocrite, okay? Call me a hypocrite (laughs) because I quit looking. I went and I actually picked them up in my hand. I was holding them before Easter. I'm like, these would be sweet Easter shoes. (laughs) And it hit me. This is an appetite that is unhealthy. This This is a desire for excess that I don't have to have. And it is better for me to put them down and not buy them. Because I need to be reminded of what is right, what is necessary, what is good. And so I'm not buying them, not because it's wrong to have them, but because I need to be careful and I need to put up guardrails in my life. And that's exactly what I'm saying today. Hear me clearly. There is nothing inherently wrong with having money in the bank. There's nothing wrong with driving a nice car or going on a great vacation. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable or having the latest and greatest iPhone. It's okay. What is wrong is when having those things is tied to a misinformed identity that money defines us and gives us value. That's what's wrong. That's where the danger lies. So how do we root it out? 
if God has exposed it this morning, that, we, that you have a tendency to run to this misinformed identity from time to time in your life, what should you do about it? Just a few things to think about. Number one, remind yourself daily who you are in Christ. Last week when Pastor Jason introduced this series, he took us through Ephesians chapter one through three and showed us who we really are, what our true identity is. We need to remind ourselves of that daily. If you struggle with this identity and and thinking that money defines you, or any of these misinformed identities that we're gonna see. Here's a challenge for you. Memorize Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14. Commit it to memory so that every time your identity is tempted to be misinformed, you can recall the word of God. The Holy Spirit can bring it to your mind and you can start to say, no, that is not where my identity lies. lies. It is right here. It rests in who Jesus is and what he has done for me. Remind yourself daily who you are in Christ. Confront the lies of the enemy with the truth of the word of God. Also, manage your influences. If you know you have a weakness when it comes to shopping, limit the amount of time you spend in stores. If you're an impulse buyer online and like the Amazon driver, you guys exchange Christmas cards, right? Have somebody hold you accountable. When it comes to that, manage your influences. Guard against the temptation. Be smart about it. Also, embrace community. And I would even say diversify your community. Spend time with people who aren't like you. But embrace community. I'll just put a plug in right here. Men, we're about to go on a retreat here in a few weeks. You know why we do that? It's not so we can get away and eat red meat and not have our wives not fuss at us about it. (laughs) The reason we do it is because it's good for us to have men in our lives that can speak truth into our lives and hold us accountable and encourage us to pursue Jesus and not other things. Embracing community. Get in a growth group. Do life with other believers. It will help guard against some of these misinformed identities. Here's another one. Practice generosity. Do you know what Jesus said is the litmus test for whether you have a misinformed identity when it comes to money? How generous you are. Doesn't matter if you have a lot or a little. What is your level of generosity? That will tell you whether you struggle in the area of money. Practicing generosity is a great cure for a misinformed identity when it comes to money and possessions. And then the last thing, look at a better picture. And this is where we're gonna close today. If we were to skip back a little earlier in chapter 10 of Mark, right before the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, Jesus has just spent time with a group of kids, with a little group of children. You remember this, the disciples have been like, get these guys away from Jesus, they're bothering him. He says, don't you dare. This is what the kingdom of heaven looks like. You must come to me as a little child if you want to inherit the kingdom. Like this is what it looks like. Why did he say that? Because they were helpless? Because they couldn't support themselves? They were weak, vulnerable, and he said, this, this is what the kingdom is about. You see, the rich young ruler thought it was about what he could acquire, what he could have, how powerful he could be, and he ran right by the better picture, which was to come to Jesus empty-handed empty of self, not holding on to stuff to determine value, but to come with empty hands, saying, Jesus, all I need is you. Only you can satisfy me. And he missed it. He missed the better picture. So the question today is, are you going to miss the better picture? 
Are you going to continue to allow your identity to be misinformed and saying that money is what will make you happy? It will give you value. Or are you going to do what he called the rich young ruler to do? Get rid of those idols. Understand that I am the only one who can satisfy. And come to me and I will fill you. I will give you life. Would you pray with me? God, this morning, as we have come to a time of response, God, in just a minute, our, our, our worship team's going to come and, and we're going to sing a song. And, uh, and, and I know it's, the temptation will be for us just to check out because this means the service is ending. And so we're going to start putting our Bibles away and getting our stuff together so we can get out of this room in a few minutes and get on with our day. But God, would you not allow us to do that this morning? God, would you so work in our hearts in this moment that we really do pause in these last few moments together and we consider whether our identity has been tied to our stuff, whether we've been finding security and comfort and significance in the stuff that we have rather than finding our significance in you and what you have done for us. And God, if that is the case, if that is true at times in our lives, God, would you this morning encourage, convict, challenge us to root it out, to lay those things aside, to take steps, to not have our identities misinformed by this lie of our culture. God, if there's one here today who does not know you as Savior and their identity is not in you, and so by by default, it is in so many other things. God, would today be the day of salvation for them? That they would come and they would fall on their knees before you, confess their need for you, and believe, Jesus, that you died for them. You took their place. You paid for their sin debt. And you, have, and you are offering them eternal life in you. May today be the day that they switch their allegiance from whatever it's been in and they place it in you today. God, if it's just today, if there's those in the room who are just struggling at times of just forgetting where their identity really rests, that it's in you, God, would you cause them to remember today? So God, whatever you wanna do, God, would you have your way, have the freedom to move in our lives in these moments. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We are going to sing this song. This is a time to respond. I can't tell you how to do that. I can just say it's time to respond. And that if God is moving in your life, you need to respond. You can use these steps as an altar to pray. You can come pray with one of our ministers who will be down front. You can pray right where you sit. But would you respond today if the Lord is working in your life? Let's sing together.